Hello, this is Dr. Ross, and this is the video lecture for the epithelial tissue overview. So epithelial tissues are widespread throughout the body and include the epithelia and glands. They perform a variety of functions that includes protection, secretion, absorption, filtration, diffusion, and sensory reception. Epithelial tissue covers all external surfaces <clears throat> and even covers internal surfaces as well. This includes body cavities and hollow organs. The glands are structures that produce fluid secretions and they're either attached to or derived from the epithelia. Alright, so there's several characteristics of epithelia you should be aware of. So starting with the cells, epithelial cells are tightly packed together with very little intracellular matrix, as you can see in this image. Because the tissues form coverings and linings, the cells are going to have one free surface that is not in contact with other cells. And then opposite, opposite that free surface, the cells are going to be attached to an underlying connective tissue by what's called a basement membrane, and that area is non-cellular. So we refer to this difference as polarity. Okay, so polarity um, is where, the in this case, the exposed surface is called the apical surface. Um, and that's going to either be facing the external environment or an internal space. And this can be, this surface can be modified with microvilli or cilia. The part of the cell attached to the underlying tissue is called the basal surface. And then the side of the cells are referred to as the lateral surface. So epithelial tissue also exhibits a high degree of cellularity. Um, epithelia is composed almost entirely of cells. As I've mentioned uh, already, epithelial cells are attached to um, um, a thin non-cellular basement membrane, um, which is shown here. The basement membrane adheres to the basal surface of the cells and to the underlying tissues that establish the cell's border as well as resist stretching. Epithelial cells also exhibit, or I'm sorry, epithelial tissue also exhibits regeneration, meaning that if epithelial cells are damaged or lost at the exposed surface, they're going to be replaced <coughs> continuously. Regeneration is a characteristic of other tissues as well, but the rates of cell division and replacement are typically much higher in epithelial tissue than in other tissues. Lastly, I want to mention that epithelial tissue is a vascular, meaning that it lacks blood vessels. Epithelial cells, of course, still need to get nutrients, and they do so by diffusion or absorption across either the exposed surface or the attached epithelial surface. So epithelial cells can come in more than one shape and size. In fact, there are three types of cells and they can be combined in different ways to create epithelial tissue. These different combinations and how you will name them will be discussed in the next lecture. So I'd like to start here by just describing the cells themselves. So squamous cells have the appearance of thin, kind of flat plates. Their, names comes from, their name comes from squama, which is Latin for scale, um, like a scale on a fish or a snake. The cells in this case are going to fit closely together at, in tissues, and they'll provide a really smooth, low friction surface over which fluids can move easily. Squamous cells tend to, have a, to, tend to have a horizontally flattened, kind of oval-shaped nuclei because of this thin, flattened form of the cell. The squamous epithelium is going to be found lining surfaces such as skin or the alveoli of the lung. Um, and, and in this case, it's going to enable simple diffusion um, of, of gases. Um, <clears throat> This is an example of an, a squamous epithelial cell. It's a microscopic image of squamous epithelial cells from inside of the cheek. Um, these have been removed from the cheek, so this wouldn't be uh, how they would appear when they are attached to the tissue. Cuboidal epithelial cells, uh, as the name implies, have a cube-like shape. 
The cell nucleus is large, spherical, and is in the center of the cell. Cuboidal epithelium is commonly found in tissues such as exocrine glands or in absorptive tissues such as the pancreas. Uh, shown here, this is a cross section of a kidney tubule, uh, and the this this ring here you can see is composed of cuboidal epithelial cells. The ring, of course, would be the cross section of a tubule here. Uh, lastly, let's talk about columnar epithelial cells. These are elongated and column shaped and have a height at least four times their width. The nuclei are going to appear elongated and they are usually located near the base of the cells. Columnar epithelium forms the lining of stomach and intestines. This is an image showing columnar cells lining a mammalian gut. The light purple blobs are not the nuclei, they are full of mucin. Uh, which will be secreted and form the mucus that lines the gut. The dark purple um, are below that are the nuclei. So the apical surface of an epithelial tissue can be modified from just a regular cell in a couple of ways. In the surface, if the surface is covered in dead cells full of hard, dry protein, um, a protein called keratin, then the tissue is called keratinized. The only tissue in the body that gets this label is the epidermis. If the surface features many long, thin, hair-like projections called cilia, the tissue is called ciliated. And these tissues are found in the respiratory tract, to name, to name one. This surface can also feature small bumps called microvilli. Um, for whatever reason, these are never included in the tissue name, and these can be found in the digestive tract. So to be an effective barrier, epithelium must form a complete cover or lining, and there's three factors that help maintain the physical integrity of epithelium. So one is attachment uh, to the basement membrane. Another is that epithelium must maintain and repair itself. And finally, um, the cells must form intracellular connections uh, using cell junctions. Um, and these are just basically specialized areas of the plasmid membrane that attach a cell to another cell or to an extracellular material. The three most common types are a tight junction, okay? So tight junctions hold cells closely together and prevent diffusion of solutes and fluids between the cells. So basically they prevent leaking of contents between the two adjacent cells. The next one is desmosomes. These also adhere cells together and are found in high numbers in tissues that are subject to a lot of mechanical forces um, because they're very strong and they resist stretching, bending, twisting, and compression. The strength comes from being anchored to the cytoskeleton and they're found in the superficial layers of the skin. Um, this is one reason why skin peels instead of shedding after burning. Uh, last is gap junctions. These hold adjacent cells together, um, but also allow movement of, of solutes between adjacent cells. So basically they connect the cytoplasms of those cells, and this allows a direct pathway for cell communication as well as electrical, um, electrical coupling, and the gap junctions um, can open and close. All right, so now I'd like to turn my attention to glands. Glands are collections of epithelial cells or structures derived from epithelial cells. There are two main types classified by where they deliver their secretions. You have endocrine and exocrine. Endocrine glands are going to release uh, the secretion into the blood. Um, and an example of this would be hormones. Um, for example, the thyroid gland, the thymus, and the pituitary gland are all going to function as endocrine glands as they secrete and release hormones into the blood. All right, so exocrine glands are glands which produce um, secretions which are discharged onto an epithelial surface. Most exocrine glands um, secretions reach the surface through a tubular duct which empties onto the skin surface or onto an epithelium that lines an internal passageway. Um, examples of exocrine secretions are enzymes, um, 
uh, that enter the digestive tract, perspiration on the skin, tears in the eyes, and milk produced by mammary glands. Now, we uh, classify exocrine, exocrine glands from three perspectives. One, by the structure of the gland itself. Two, by how those glands secrete their products. And three, by what those products are. So starting with the structure, we can classify the exocrine gland as unicellular. So if you look at the top right image, this is a goblet cell, and they are found along, along the mucous membranes where they secrete mucin. That's what's filling uh, the top of this cell. Once the mucin combines with water, it forms mucus. Um, exocrine glands can also be multicellular, and that's shown on the image in the bottom. These glands are composed of cells that secrete substances, and that's going to be termed the secretary, secretory per, portion, as well, and the cells that... Um, conduct the secretions or move them out, those are going to be called the duct. Okay, and that's the conducting portion. Uh, and then, of course, these multicellular glands can be further divided into different categories. So a, a duct will be considered simple if it has a single unbranched duct. Um, and the gland is composed of... Um, if the gland is, I'm sorry, if the gland is compound, then the duct is branching. So a simple duct will be one that is um, unbranched, and a compound duct, uh, as seen along the bottom, will be considered branching or branched. Within these categories, the glands can be um, then described as either tubular or acinar. So a tubular gland looks like <clears throat> a tube. You can have a simple tubular and a compound tubular. An acinar gland has a rounded or grape-like area where the secretory cells are located. And you can again have simple or compound acinar glands. And then some glands kind of resemble both, and those are going to be called tubuloacinar or tubuloacinar. Um, so as I mentioned, exocrine glands can also be classified by their modes of secretion. So mirocrine secretion is the most common type of exocrine secretion. The secretions are enclosed in vesicles that move to the apical surface of the cells uh, where the contents are released by exocytosis. Um, the eccrine glands that produce and secrete sweat are an example. And then you have apocrine secretion. Uh, this is where the secretion accumulates near the top of the cell. Uh, near the apical portion of the cell, um, and then its secretory contents pinch off from the cell and are released. Examples um, include sweat glands of the armpit. Um, both mirocrine and abrocrine glands continue to produce and secrete their contents with little damage caused to the cell uh, because, as you can see in the images, the nucleus and the Golgi regions are going to remain intact after these secretions. However, um, in holocrine secretion, um, you actually disrupt and uh, rupture the entire gland cell. So in this case, uh, the cell accumulates products and then releases them through bursting. Um, examples of this is going to be, an example of this will be a sebaceous gland that produces oils on skin and hair. So epithelial cells and glands, as well as other accessories, can be found in many membranes of the body. So I want to just review or go over those real quickly. So these membranes consist of an epithelial layer that's going to be attached to the connective tissue for support. So we have our cutaneous membrane, which is the skin. It's a protective organ, and it's our first line of defense against infection. It, prevents, it provides other functions as well that we will discuss in subsequent lectures in this um, in this unit. The mucous membrane is another protective membrane. However, it's not quite as durable as skin. Uh, mucous membranes line the body cavities and hollow passageways that open to the external environment. This includes digestive, respiratory, excretory, and reproductive tracts. The mucosa or the mucus uh, is produced by the epithelial exocrine glands, those goblet cells that cover the epithelial layer. A serous membrane lines cavities that do not open to the outside, and they cover organs located within those cavities. So serous membranes have two layers, an outer layer that lines the body cavity, that's called the parietal layer, and an inner layer that lines or covers the internal organs, and that's called the visceral layer. Serous fluid is secreted by the, those cells, um, and this lubricates and <clears throat> the membrane and reduces friction between the two layers. 
Last, the synovial membrane or synovium uh, lines the inner surface and is capable of, <clears throat> I'm sorry, is, lines the inner surface of the capsule of a synovial joint and secretes synovial fluid, which serves also as a lubricating function. So this allows the joint surfaces to smoothly move across each other. And that is it for this introductory lecture, lecture on epithelial tissue. Thank you.